Every flight simulator enthusiast, and that does include me, dreams of flying a real airliner. Now, back in the days when dinosaurs were roaming the earth, I was a young, bold pilot flying cargo in old C-47 and C-123s. But I never had a chance to fly the big jets like this Boeing 737-800. The cockpit of a C-47 was analog, and so much simpler compared to the high-tech digital cockpit of a modern jetliner. Now, I caught the simulator bug only after I retired and when a friend of mine, who is a real 737 airline captain for Ryanair, he started to tell me what it takes to fly the big jets. I was fascinated with the complexity of modern jet flying compared with the relative seat-of-the-pants flying I used to do in the C-47s. Setting up a simple and very basic flight simulator on a single computer was quite easy. All it takes is a simple joystick and the proper software. So my first simulator was just that. Flight Simulator 10 and a Logitech Extreme 3D Pro joystick. But the simulator bug bit deeper and soon I was building a multiple monitor system to produce a more realistic experience. It went from a single monitor to a three and then four screen unit in a very short time. It wasn't long before I decided that clicking a mouse on a screen object to get switches to click and knobs to turn wasn't real enough. So the next step was to purchase some external hardware. First came a throttle quadrant from Flight Simulator Center in Italy. About the same time, I purchased a Captain 737 yoke with some steel pedals from Open Cockpits in Spain. My simulator went from three monitors to four and to five and then to six, as I added a dedicated monitor to mimic the forward overhead. Three monitors represented the outside view. Two touch screens represented the main instrument panel, and one touch screen held my forward overhead. Now the system was coming along, and, as I expected, I realized that what I was trying to do was to create the illusion of flying this cockpit. And that is what building a flight simulator is all about. Creating the most perfect illusion of flying. In short, I needed a bigger space and more equipment. I had a small spare bedroom, so after clearing out all the furniture and putting on a new coat of paint on the walls, I was ready to construct my cockpit. The most important part of the simulator is the main instrument panel, because it is around this that the rest of the cockpit evolves. Of course, I looked into purchasing one, but the cost was beyond me. So what I did is I decided to build one from scratch. Now, I'd already seen one that Raw Christensen had built in his room from wood, and so that, with that in mind, I set about designing the frame for my cockpit. I went online and saw that others had already laid the groundwork, and schematics for building a 737 were readily available. I could make mine as complex or as simple as I wanted, and so after examining all the plans available, I settled on just two drawings. These two from open cockpits and drawn by Pedro Bibelone. Now, they were straightforward and easy to follow, and I decided to build the main instrument panel, first using some 8 by 6 centimeter timber and some various size sheets of Conti board, which I purchased from a nearby DIY store. I cut the pieces to match the dimension of a real main instrument panel, 
and deliberately designed it to hold three Hans G HD 23 1s touch screens, which would represent the main instruments for me. Next, I constructed a glare shield to hold a replica FS and MCP modules, also from open cockpits in Spain. Some grey paint I got from Amazon helped with the illusion. Mounting the three touchscreen monitors and attaching the cables came next, along with locating the computer that was going to run the whole thing. A new CD FMC module from Open Cockpits was added next to a small 10 inch color CCTV monitor to act as a lower display. Now I was ready to mount my latest purchase a replica forward overhead from Open Cockpits in Spain. In order to do that, I had to build a wooden framework that would hold the overhead as well as provide the framework for the actual sides and roof of my cockpit. Open cockpits provided some convenient mounting points, which were easy to use to secure the overhead to the frame. More grey paint, in fact lots more grey paint, and the cockpit was beginning to take shape. I purchased an Epson EH5210 projector and mounted it to the wall above the rear of the cockpit and put up a large white bedsheet to act as a screen as soon as I stretched it out. All that was left was to add some speakers and connecting the power, the USB and the monitor cables to the computer. And this is what's in that tower box. The motherboard is an Asus X99 Deluxe U3.1. That, by the way, has got a socket 2011 version 3. The processor is an Intel Core i7-5820K. I have 32 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM made up of four Corsair Dominator Platinum memory modules. The power supply is a Cooler Master M2, 1000 watts. I have a Pioneer BDR206 Blu-ray burner. I have three EVGA GeForce GTX 680 graphic cards, a crucial M500, which is a 250 gigabyte solid state drive, holds all of my system files. Whereas a WD 500 gigabyte Velociraptor, also a SATA 3, is there for all of my extra files and storage. Now it's time to turn it on and see if it all works. Using a couple of chairs borrowed from the dining room, I installed the Windows 10 Professional Operating System, 64-bit, and then installed the software I would need for the simulator. I used P3D from Lockheed Martin and PMDG 737NGX for my aircraft. I set up PMDG using the 2D panels and distributed them across the three main touchscreen monitors to represent the instrument panel. To connect the software to the hardware, I used SIOC, and that's of course from Open Cockpits, and OC4BA RIS software from Raw Christensen, and then to add the best weather, I included Active Sky with their latest cloud art. I have a Navigraph account so I can display the various approach plates on a small Samsung XE7000 T1A slate tablet which I mounted on the side. Everything was calibrated but what I was missing is a radio pedestal in order to complete the current level of the illusion. Now a complete radio pedestal was out of my reach, 
but I saw an opportunity to purchase five basic plug-and-play radio modules from open cockpits. Having run out of cash, I decided to build my own pedestal using the very materials that came from the shipping containers. Now, making sure I kept the correct measurements and using some bits of 8 by 6 centimeter timber left over, I built the base and then added the top. A little paint and the finished product didn't look bad at all, especially when I pasted on some pictures of the other modules on the complete pedestal in order to enhance the effect. The last thing to be done was to line the inside of the cockpit to provide that unique claustrophobic effect. For this, I hit on the idea of using some vinyl floor covering, which I managed to get in a suitable light grey. I found that the vinyl flooring was strong enough to take the curves without sagging, and I used a simple heavy-duty staple gun to tack the material into place. And then, reasonably pleased with the finished result, I hit on the idea of replacing the white bed sheet with a large piece of white vinyl flooring, and that made the screen so much clearer and cleaner as these pictures show. I attached a checklist to the yoke and fixed the Logitech wingman on the side configured in FS UIPC to use it as a tiller. I also assigned the buttons to some useful functions such as pushback and activating the jetway among others. Adding some personal overhead lights and then turning off the main room light, the effect is really quite good. In other words, the illusion is quite realistic. Now let's have a video walk around. You can enter the fight simulator room from my hallway and there you can see the base of the radio pedestal and now having a look around the side here we move here show you the switches that turn everything on in a moment there they are bottom one turns on the projector top one turns on the computer and there's the the computer itself extra material on the floor there Now you can see the back end of the, oh, there's the projector. And you can see the back of, this is the forward overhead from open cockpits. And got a little angle bracket there. And that screws directly on, that one and the next one, screw on to the forward overhead. There it is, at the other end of it. And that holds it in place. I use that piece of uh, wood there to hide all of the wiring. And you can see the material. There's the... It looks a bit <laughs> strange, I know, from this angle. But that's vinyl floor covering. I could have been a bit tidier with it, but I was getting anxious to get it up and running. You can see all the staples there. Speakers there in the background. And it gives that claustrophobic feel. This, of course, is one big piece of vinyl flooring, but white. Not a brilliant white, 
but white enough that it handles the job and again all it is is stapled. And that's some extra, I bought a, more than I needed, it was an off cut so I bought the whole off cut so I've got some extra there at the point where I need it. That's the back of the uh, throttle quadrant that you see at the far back end of that and the sound system and there's the three hands-free touchscreen monitors that comprise my main instrument panel. I really will have to do something about all these wires one day. <laughs> one day, perhaps. And there's the back end of the pedals. <coughs> USB wires. I had lots of USBs that I needed to plug in. And I label each of the uh, cables so that they can be identified. And there's the three graphic cards, the 680s, G4 680s, and the SLI connecting them. Although, of course, I'm not using SLI since I've got so many uh, videos, video uh, monitors connected to it. And there's the solid state drive. That's my primary drive. Looks a bit clumsy, but it tends to work. Well, one cable goes all the way out and goes up to the projector. That's HDMI. Most of it is HDMI connected. Now we're looking at it from the proper side. There's the forward overhead from open cockpits. And the two lights I put on with the switches. There's my glare shield. With uh, I had two FS on that. One's first officer and of course MCP in the middle. And the three touch screens and here you can see how I made one side into a dummy this is nothing more than a CCTV monitor 10 inch but it's connected with HDMI and you can see the FMCCDU on the side there. When I get enough money, I'll get another FMCCDU to fill in uh, that gap <laughs> one of these days. But it doesn't look bad. And this, of course, is the throttle quadrant from Flight Simulator Center in Italy. And there is my radio pedestal. I actually got the box replaced. I found a, a case from GLB Flight Productions for only a hundred quid. Now there's you can see the modules for the from open cockpits. All USB connected.
and as a piece of the old packing case. Just cut it out to uh, match the gap. Pasted on some pictures to give an illusion. Put the mouse on top and away you go. Pedals and the yoke from open cockpits. Keyboard in the background there for other functions. And there's my checklist on the yoke. And I made myself a couple of cubby holes on either side on the glare shield to put some charts and other things. The footrest. <laughs> oh, speaker at the bottom there. So that's, I've got four speakers and a subwoofer. The all important shelf for holding, um, well, Cups of tea, coffee, <clears throat> an occasional beer. As one of the speakers. Everything is bolted down to make it um, secure. There's the forward overhead again. I like that ability to be able to touch and click a switch and turn a knob. Now that, of course, is my Samsung. It's Windows 10. It's a slate tablet. Runs Windows and I have my Navigraph uh, account on that. And the Logitech Wingman that is set up to be the tiller. The chairs I uh, sort of uh, purloined out of the dining room. <laughs> one day I might get some captain's chairs from one of the local wrecking yards. Mouse in place for when I need to use it. It does look... Uh, Quite convincing. Now we've got the power on. Big job, of course, when uh, setting everything up was to assign all of the proper windows to each of the screens and to make sure that they were all in the location as needed. Of course, the room overhead light, uh, room light is still on, so that's spoiling the effect at the moment, but we'll turn that off in a moment. There it goes. Now you can see it has a slightly different look and feel to it.
not the tidiest of uh, lining the ceiling of the cockpit. I might do something better about it later, but it's okay for the moment. Now this is with all the panels all assigned and all lit. Now you can see how the three panels, the three touch screens, work a little magic with the main instrument panel there. And that's the outside view. Not sure where this is. It's some place that's uh, dusk and uh, dark and dreary, raining. does look good when it's all lit up doesn't it and there's my side panel just like uh, the pilots do in the commercial jet liners oh that's where I am here cuts in the Russian Federation uh, this slate of course is also a touchscreen there's my computer and the power switches and I did tell you that I had assigned the buttons <coughs> to various functions such as the jetway and uh, push back things like that Here's a close-up now of the main instrument panel. I can operate some of the things on there with my finger because they're touch screens. That's the first officer's side. Right, let's try it out. Simple take Checklist complete.
one. Crew released. Flaps up. down flaps switches on Thank <laughs> you. 